lot of teachers that I loved and had a huge impact on my life, but one that really uh, comes to memory is Miss Frances Herlong. She was my fourth grade teacher. And the reason I remember her is she wore red every day. That was her favorite color. And when we went to the cafeteria every day, she required, or we called it lunch room back then, she required that we taste everything, a little bit of everything on our plate. And so to Miss Frances Herlong, I can owe now that I do like turnip greens. Now, I never ate turnip greens until I had her, but she was a wonderful teacher. And the other thing I remember about her was I was in her classroom on November 22nd, 1963 when President John Kennedy was assassinated and the intercom came on and I'll never forget how she handled the class in such a loving way. She was very special. Indeed, we want to celebrate our special teachers tonight and we are in for a treat. Good evening and thank you for joining us on Carolina Classrooms. I'm Dawn Samples. We have with us in the studio this evening five of our finest teachers from throughout the state. All five are finalists for the coveted title of 2016 South Carolina Teacher of the Year. In order to get all of these folks here at one time, we taped this program prior to the announcement of the winner, which took place on April 22nd. So I want to say to each of you, good luck. And at the end of tonight's program, we will reveal and show you the exciting announcement. Also, later in the show, we'll see some short clips of these teachers in action. But for now, let's meet them. I'll introduce them to you alphabetically according to the district they represent. First, we have Albert Robertson, who is a seventh grade social studies teacher at Meadow Glen Middle School, it's my home district, in Lexington School District 1. Welcome, Albert. It's great to be here, Don. Thank you. Next, we have Daniel Otto, a math teacher at Dreer High School in Richland School District 1. Hi, Daniel. Thank you, Don. Thank Good you for coming. Jeannie Durham is also with us. Jeannie represents the Rock Hill School District at Rolison Road Middle School where she teaches science. Welcome Jeannie. Honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Next is another science teacher from the upstate, Hunter Jolly, who teaches at Boiling Springs High School in Spartanburg School District 2. Welcome Hunter. Thank you for having us. And rounding out the top five is Suzanne Cody, an English teacher from Sumter High School in Sumter School District. Congratulations to all of you and thank you for, for taking the time to be here. Um, and Suzanne, thank you for coming. We're thank you. you. <laughs> so um, being an educator myself, I know what a huge honor it is and, and all the work that you've put into being nominated and being here. So thank you for coming and taking the time to be with us tonight. So we're going to start off just talking a little bit about um, how your lives have changed just a, a little um, since the announcement a few weeks ago. If you could summarize it and just think of two or three words that really summarize for you the change that has happened and how you have felt in the last few weeks, what would those words be? Definitely something that uh, I felt is honored and privileged to be in a position like this and just supremely humbled and uh, just, just really excited. Um, it's, it's definitely been uh, a big change and exciting, I think, for all of us. It's been a really cool thing. Great. Daniel? It, it, humbling, for sure. Uh, I, I work with so many fine, talented educators, uh, not only in my school, but in my district, and obviously throughout the state. And uh, to be singled out in this way, it's, it's, it still takes a little getting used to, but it is humbling and, and inspiring. Yes. And I would agree with Daniel. It has been very humbling and, and very inspiring. And you do have doors open to just realize how many great educators there are out there and, and how much they do need to be celebrated in South Carolina and just how they use their gifts every day to enrich the lives of children. So it's been a very honoring and very humbling experience. Yes. What an amazing opportunity to showcase the successful and wonderful teachers we have here in South Carolina in a positive way. And to be a part of that is simply amazing. Um, I can't believe it. And I feel extremely blessed because I know that I'm simply one of many of the teachers who are doing fine things in their classrooms every day across our state. And so I'm hopeful, I'm inspired, I'm excited about the future. 
That's great. Well, we're going to take a look now at each of these teachers in action. The South Carolina Department of Education has shared with us a short profile of each finalist that was produced for the Teacher of the Year celebration. So we're going to start off with Albert Robertson from Meadow Glen Middle School. I've always been inspired to work with uh, other folks and teach them things. My grandma was a huge inspiration for me as um, somebody who kind of showed me how learning wasn't necessarily the, the focus in some cases, it was a byproduct. I was kind of learning math at the same time and these things that were kind of happening. They taught me that in some cases the best learning happens when you don't even know you're learning. When I got to high school, I had some really awesome teachers who inspired me, one of them being my teacher cadet teacher over at North Augusta High School. I was able to uh, take part in the teacher cadet program and applied for a teaching fellows scholarship. So I was in one of the first uh, couple groups of teaching fellows that graduated from Newberry. And uh, I, I was able to get my first job here in Lexington One with my current principal, Dr. Kuhn. I taught seventh grade social studies for the first six years of my career. And then for the past three years, I've been a looping teacher. So I've taught seventh the first year, then I taught sixth last year and moved up with the same group of kids to seventh grade this year. And it's been a great experience. Who else is an allied power at this point? Ella? England. England, very good. Anna? The Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, tell me a backstory there. Something that I would hope to achieve as a state teacher of the year would be to help teachers and districts understand that you know, we're gonna have to come together as a state, break down the barriers that exist between our schools, between our districts, districts and between different regions in the state and come together to bring us to the top. Getting teacher forums very much active to push for recognition for all teachers in our state. I'm so excited every day. I've never worked a day in my life because I love what I do. I love coming and working with these kids. Um, they know that my goal is to build relationships and to, to change lives as a teacher and I keep in touch with them over the years. I've got kids that email me back from college. I had some students when they found out I was a finalist, they called or they called their parents and their parents emailed me. It's, it's something that continues to go on. It's not just a 180 day relationship. So Albert, obviously relationships are important to you. So what are some things that you do to build relationships with your students? Well, something that uh, I feel like Again, relationships are crucial with the kids, um, and I, I really just, I love them. I get to know them. I, I figure out who they are, what their likes are, what their dislikes are. I listen to the music they listen to. I try to keep in touch with kind of popular trends that are happening, you know, throughout the world or pop culture, things like that. Just trying to make sure that they know that I care about them and that they know that they can come to me if they're ever having a situation or an issue that they'd like to talk about. I just think it's so crucial for all of our students um, to think about the, the things that they bring to the table and not as just, oh, this, this poor student has so many difficulties or so many issues. Not, not as baggage that they bring, but as things we can build bridges to, to help support them in. And uh, I think building those relationships is just a crucial part of being, being a good teacher and good role model. And um, in so many cases, these kids don't come with uh, a maybe teacher or pastor or coach, people like that, you kind of have to be a little bit of everything for them. Right. It is critical. Well, thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll take a look at Daniel Otto in action at Dreer High School. I'm very thankful to be at Dreer High School. Um, eight years ago, I made a decision. Uh, I was a uh, school principal, and I really felt a, a calling in my heart that uh, I need to be back in the classroom. Uh, I'm very fortunate that Mr. Kabauer has received me here at Dreer, and uh, upon uh, my request to come back to teach in the classroom, uh, I asked for um, classes that sometimes others shy away from, and I have overwhelming success with them. And um, it, it is a passion of mine to reach out to these kids and to speak some truths that they can and will be successful. And then to watch that come to fruit, it's just there's no greater joy. Well, I think in South Carolina, we have to realize that there are um, stories unfolding in the lives of students. Um, I step into their lives and um, teach way more than math. Um, teach them about their future. 
So my message to South Carolina is, is we have success. There are examples out there that kids are being successful, even in the areas where they struggle the most. In content areas like mathematics, we have success. It's happening here at Dreher High School. It's happening within my classroom. And I want the testimony of the examples of the students to be my message to the state of South Carolina that good things are happening in the state and we are moving in the right direction. A four on applied math, so you're right in here, right? So how many more people are as competitive as you for a job? I love coming, I love seeing my kids learn and excel. One of the things that I do, I intentionally sit in each one of their chairs, and they don't know this. And sometimes it gives me an opportunity to think about that student in another way that I hadn't thought about before. And sometimes it just gives me a mindful thought in regards what I need to do with this kid today what I need to say to them. It's not about the math, it's about being successful. And um, so I'm excited to come to work every day and I'm excited to have an opportunity to be, be used to touch the lives of kids. So Daniel, one of the things that um, I really took away from your segment is when you talk about preparing students for the future, not mm -hmm. just focusing on the content, but really having them ready for what's to come. So what are some things that you feel like are important for kids to know and for them to be prepared for the future and for life in general? Uh, that particular uh, day, that lesson, it was, a, it was kind of a fun one. We were looking at the um, work keys uh, as part of the college and career readiness uh, assessments that South Carolina is transitioning into. And um, it, it it's, it's very real for, for the students uh, in that particular classroom that uh, we had this video on. Um, they, they, they may want to become a fireman, uh, they may want to um, go into engineering, that type of thing, and to see uh, the level of expectation that, uh, that the career field has for them, uh, it became very real. Mm -hmm. And actually it was kind of a fun lesson that day because I was actually using data from work keys to actually teach kind of like work keys type assessment questions. And so that, that was kind of neat. Um, but I have to kind of piggyback up on, on Albert. Um, th there's a relationship I have with my students and uh, just seeing those guys again on, on TV, it just, uh, I love them. And um, they feel safe in my room. And um, I don't teach math, math. I teach students. And um, it's just, there's a great relationship going on there. And uh, I, it, again, it's, it's humbling to be, just even see some of that uh, on, 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 the, on the program here. It, um, but I like to see some good things for the kids and um, knowing what's in, in store for them and that they can do it. They can do it. Thank you. Thank you, you for sharing that. Next, we're moving on to watch a clip from Jeannie Durham at Rawlinson Road Middle School. My story is probably a little bit different. My path into education was quite indirect. I, unlike many people in the education profession, I did not set out originally to become a teacher. I started out as a science major and then spent some time in industrial organizational psychology. I was contacted by a principal that was in desperate need of a science teacher. And I knew that I'd had experience working in other venues with young people and how much I loved that. And I just felt a calling deep within that that's the direction that I needed to take. If I were chosen as state teacher of the year, I think that I have a couple of messages that are really important to me. The first of which would be one of encouragement. I think teachers have one of the most important jobs in the world as we impact and interact with um, the future of our world every day. And I think that that is such a valuable, valuable profession. It's not always an easy job. There's challenges along the way. I also have on my heart just a real love and compassion for diversity. Students come from different backgrounds, they have different language abilities, and just embracing that and learning to learn from each other and the gifts that everyone has to contribute to the table. Don't be afraid to do it, you know, to where you can see, okay? There's your streak test, white powder. Okay? Then we're going to run some hardness tests, and this will be a good thing to show as well. Sure, the academic success is absolutely important and vital, but it's deeper than that. It comes from the relationships that you establish along the way, the hugs that you might get in the hallway, the holler from across the store. I get a lot of joy out of 
students who come over from the high school or in college wanting to tell me that they're successful and making sure to share that with me. So Jeannie, some of the words that resonated with me in your clip, um, I heard a lot about celebrate and encouragement and joy and diversity. And one thing I noticed is that that's not all about the content. Again, as with our previous presenters here, it's about the student. What are, what are ways that you help encourage and bring joy and celebrate joy and diversity in your classroom? Being a middle school science teacher, and I think there are other teachers that experience this as well, but in the middle school in science, we have a classroom of inclusion. So that presents a different situation for us than may exist at other grade levels. Not only do you have diversity in ethnics and diversity in ability, but we also have included a number of students who may have disabilities significant enough to warrant their placement in a self-contained classroom. So it becomes so important to realize that no matter what others may have, whatever might be viewed as a shortcoming can actually be gifts and that we can learn from each other and count our blessings. And it is a joyful opportunity when you get to know students and you make that effort to reach them and know them on a more personal level. It's very true that content is important and academics are important but sometimes you can't reach what you need to there if the relationships aren't developed. Absolutely, a recurring theme here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now let's travel on to Boiling Springs High School and drop in on one of the classrooms of Hunter Jolly. I am from a family whose mother worked three jobs. Uh, I've come to appreciate all things and understand the value of hard work and dedication. Uh, while attending USC Upstate, I was a pre-med major originally um, and found joy in doing free tutoring um, for nursing and other majors in the afternoon. We would have 30 or 40 kids that would show up, I'd pick up pizzas and we would just hang out and, and work through. But I loved teaching and spending time with these students in the afternoons. Um, had the teacher for an advanced anatomy class come to me and tell me for the first time ever she had received um, an, an A-B average for her classes. Um, and the students said that, you know, they, it was in part due to my tutoring in the afternoons. In my quiet time one day, I, I, it sort of dawned on me that, you know, I really enjoy this, so why am I, why am I going to go to a medical school when I, when I love this? <laughs> Moving up, I'm getting excited, I'm getting like pumped up, like a woo! <laughs> yes! Like I drank six Red Bulls, I'm good to go, and then what happens? I lose energy, so I have to drop, so as I drop, what am I If I'm say? selected as State Teacher of the Year for the State of South Carolina, I would like to spend that time advocating for teachers, advocating for students, uh, garnering a better understanding of what it is that we do. We aren't just teachers, we're nurses, we're uh, philosophers, we are moms and dads, we're coaches. Uh, we are everything for these students. And it's time that we command or, or hold ourselves um, in, that, in that light in our community as well as within ourselves. I want it to be a time in which when individuals introduce themselves as a teacher, it's not a mumble of, I'm just a teacher, um, but more of a, I'm a teacher, so what do you do? So Hunter, in your clip, you, um, you spoke a lot about advocacy as part of what your platform would be. Um, and one of the things too, I think that you can't help but take away from your segment is the engagement that you see with your students. So how would you engage your, your community and um, your students in advocating for themselves, for their own education? What are things that you would do? I think that <clears throat> that's something that I, that I already I do a, a good bit of with my students, and that is that idea of just understanding what that student's goal is. A lot of times it's a, an idea of helping them break that cycle that they feel like they're gonna be a victim of. Um, you know, the, the kids that come from single parent homes or that, that come from poverty stricken homes, showing them that, you know, that is not the acceptable option that you have to settle for. Um, and together we can work through this. 
a lot of it is just simply putting that knowledge into that student's hands or being that person that's that cheerleader. Uh, for example, we had a, a, a incidents in our uh, community where a student of mine that was very close to me passed away after graduation in a car wreck. Um, we, uh, the adults that surrounded that child uh, took that as an opportunity to help our students um, embrace one another and embrace issues that were within our own community. Um, based off of that we built a Habitat for Humanity home named it after that child. We're the first student funded house built in the state of South Carolina. Um, so it gave our kids something to work through and work for. Um, so I think a lot of it is just making those relationships that were said earlier um, and helping students understand that at the end of the day, they may not have anybody else that they've got me in their corner. That's great, thank you. Thanks. Well, now we're gonna head on to Sumter High School and take a look at Suzanne Cody's classroom. I'm in my 11th year at Sumter High, um, and I've taught at this school my entire career. I did not originally want to be a teacher. I went into the medical field, and after I had children, I stayed home with my children for five years. Um, when I took my daughter to school, to elementary school, and I let go of her hand, I ran straight to the office and I said, how can I be a part of this? When I came up to Sumter High to substitute one day, my principal then, Rut Dingle, said, you need to go get certified, you are a teacher. And that's how it happened. I, from there, I haven't looked back. There's a distinction that Campbell makes, you've read about it, the distinction between the myth and the dream. Yeah. One of the things that I'm always asked is what do you teach? What I would say to those people is I teach children. We talk about how to make stories real. Obviously in the English classroom we're reading literature and we try to make those stories, the myths and all of the themes that apply come into our real life situation. And so we try to make everything applicable to their futures and what they're doing in their lives echo those stories because their lives have been informed by that, those myths. So I would say the most rewarding thing about teaching is the idea that I get to impact the future. I do this every day in my classroom with my work with students. I also lead workshops in my district and I work with three different counties of teachers through my work with the Writing Project. And so I'm impacting not only my students, but students of other teachers. I'm teaching the best practices to best mold the students' futures. I think it's important that we talk about the positive things that are happening in education. We need to let the public know about the trends. We need to let them know what we're doing in the classrooms, what we're doing for the children. And I think if we focus on that message, making sure that everything is focused on the student and on the potential to impact their futures, then that's a message that I want to spread. And it would be an extreme honor to be able to do that for our state. So Suzanne, I would completely agree with you. We have some amazing things obviously happening in our classrooms. Um, and one of the things that you want to be able to do is spread that message. What ideas do you have for how you could showcase all these good things that are happening in our classrooms? I think we have to get into the schools. We have to show the public and our community what's happening in South Carolina schools because we're not standing at the front of the classroom lecturing the students like we used to do 10, 15 years ago. We're involving the students. We're making the lessons come alive for them and we're showing how they can take what they're learning today to that next level. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to showcase that and let everyone see what we're doing. Well, and I wanna thank you all for, for letting us have a bird's eye view of your classroom. Um, uh, we've got a little bit of time now to kind of talk about some things that are happening in education and happening in South Carolina and you all are representing teachers across the state and you are leaders um, and we're at time, a time in our, our system in South Carolina where a lot of classrooms are going through a lot of change, a lot of um, content areas are going through a lot of change. So. What are some ways that you feel like you might be able to help provide leadership for your peers, for your colleagues, and for your students to lead through that change? A lot of it is simply just being the first one to take that jump um, and, and being the one that's, that's willing to uh, uh, go through the fire and, and, and work out the issues and say, you know what, I survived, it's completely okay, now you can come follow me. Um, I, we've, we've blazed a path. Uh, so I think a lot of that is just taking that initial step to showcase that it's okay if we mess up along the way, you know, we're a community, we'll work through it together. 
And in our district, the teachers are leading the workshops now. Instead of having outsiders come in to teach us on in-service days, every in-service day this year, I've been at the front of a workshop. Um, and so I think we need to spread the message that we know what we're doing and make sure that everyone is on board with the changes that are occurring. And I think districts absolutely can back their teachers. I know at Rock Hill School District 3, we have the privilege of being one-on-one -on -one with the iPads, and it has been a time of change for all educators in our district, as well as other districts across the state. Technology is something that is constantly changing, and as an educator, you constantly have to put forth effort to stay abreast and on top. But districts do a great job, or our district does, in providing professional development avenues for us to check back training videos that are available on our district website, things that really help us as educators, not only individually, but then we can spread out and grow um, in multitude. Mm -hmm. If I said to you um, that teachers are learners, how are you a learner? I have a favorite quote. Um, it's that no man steps into the river twice for the river has changed and so is the man. And I believe that this is true in our classrooms. Um, we step into the river every day with our students and we aren't just teaching the content, we're changing the terrain for them. Because you can get on your smartphone now and you can get information, but you don't know what to do with it. And so we have to be the catalyst for changing their terrain. And I think when we do that, we learn from them because I don't know at the end of a lesson where we're going to be, and so each day guides the next. Mm -hmm. Don, I've been in this profession for over 20 years, and um, <clears throat> I'm not the same I was just two years ago as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I, I just keep evolving, and um, in the, many districts, uh, like we had in Rock Hill here uh, in Richland One, we have a one-to-one -one digital uh, technology rollout initiative, and. Uh, um, I'm trying to like blend my instruction more with, with my homemade type of, <laughs> their homemade uh, videos and mm -hmm. um, to integrate my instruction with that because the students can use them outside of class time where rather now having them for 90 minutes of instruction, I now can ex extend that beyond uh, my four walls in the time I'm bound by them. So it, as a learner in the classroom, I, I, I'm just constantly trying to find the best way to drive the instruction home for the students because at the end of the day, that's, that's really what matters. We have, need to have great instruction for students because they know it when they see it and they love it and they respond to it. And uh, so I'm, I'm constantly evolving. I haven't been the same in 20 years and mm -hmm. moving on. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, well, you go ahead. Oh. Definitely something that <laughs> Um, we've been focusing on, I guess, in our district and in South Carolina has been this whole idea of a growth mindset and continually improving yourself. And it's not so much about competition between the teacher next door to me, but competition between who I was yesterday and now. So having this whole idea of me as a teacher, me as a learner, and having a district and a state that supports me in taking risks. And there's a great quote um, that inspired me kind of with Suzanne, but uh, you have to be able to be willing to go out on a limb because that's where the fruit is. Um, be able to go out and take risks and know that there's going to be a safety net when sometimes you fall and you will fall off that tightrope when you're learning things. And uh, I think modeling that and helping students understand that you know sometimes failure happens and it's okay. It's learning to pick yourself back up and get back on the horse, get back on the you know tightrope mm -hmm. and do it again. Um, so I think having that is, is an essential part and uh, there are places in South Carolina they're doing a great job um, and I think we could all kind of build each other up a little bit more to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I think extending off of that, it, it really is about the humanity and the relationships that exist in partnership with your students. Not being afraid to let them see that you're human, then they are not afraid to let you see that they're human as well. Mm -hmm. And you create a partnership. <coughs> and just letting go of that fear, I think you can just learn a great deal from each other. They may have technological skills that I'm not abreast of. Mm -hmm. I have content knowledge that maybe they're not abreast of. And just working together to make the learning environment environment, enriching, and growing. And I do think the point you made is important, that we can learn from our students, mm -hmm. and that we have to be vulnerable in front of our students and take risks. Um, I know we have a lot of emphasis on data, and that can be intimidating for teachers, especially new teachers, where this is a whole new world for them. 
If you had to give a new teacher advice about um, the accountability piece and the relationships and how all of this fits together for them in their classroom, um, what would you say to a new teacher coming into the profession about risk taking and accountability and, and how you put that together? Um, and maybe it's through building relationships, I don't know. Talk to me about that. I think that <clears throat> it, it's, it's interesting. I have the opportunity to teach um, pre-service educators at a local university also. Um, so I get to see those students that are getting ready to go out into the, the job field. And the one thing that I always discuss with them is the idea that you will be your very worst critic. Um, you will learn and you will grow because you will not accept um, anything less than 100% for your students. Um, I, I say oftentimes that teachers are the best neurotics out there, you know. Um, so when I discuss the idea of being scored or judged with my students, I always make sure that they understand that when you go into the classroom, it's your responsibility to understand where your learners are and, and work to meet them halfway. Um, and if anything, I, you know, we talk about jotting down just quick notes at the beginning of the year. I want my student to be able to do X, Y, Z. Um, a lot of times a performance-based test does not showcase or quantify the, the amount of knowledge or the amount of worth of a student. And I think that it's important that that teacher tells that student that and that there's a conversation that it's okay. It's a score, but that doesn't define you. Look at what you've done this year. Um, look at how far you've came. Um, so I think it's the, the relationship piece is key, the understanding piece is key, and the continual effort to be better at what you do the next day um, is, is the ultimate goal for all educators. And I think an educator needs to be reflective. You need to look back at what you started with at the beginning of the day and where you ended up. And was your goal starting the lesson a realistic one? And so I think if you reflect at the end of each day or even the end of each lesson and really think about where you went and where you want to go, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Daniel? Uh, my advice is, is, is don't go alone. Uh, it, <laughs> there are quality teachers. Um, or right next door and uh, you, you partner with them. And, and you mentioned about the teacher leader role. Uh, it, it, like, like Hunter, um, I intentionally work with, um, as, as a coaching teacher, that's my role, um, in you know, pre-service students coming into the, the field. And I, I intentionally work with uh, induction first year teachers and second year teachers. Uh, it's, it's purposeful and it keeps me sharp actually as an educator. So it, I mean, there may be a little bit of a, a gain on my part. But uh, I know that um, as an educator, when I broke into the field, I needed that. And I was fortunate to, to work with quality educators. One of them was my mother-in-law. And, uh, and so there's a story there. And, um, <laughs> it, it, but I, it's a blessing to work with quality teachers. And I would say to any first teacher, get in there and find those great teachers, even if they're not in your content area. Because good teaching is good teaching and, 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 and rise to that level. And it's a journey. And uh, it won't take one year. It's going to take longer, and, uh, but it's a journey. I think that's a good point. I think we get impatient with ourselves sometimes. Albert, were you going to say something? Well, we're, we're at an interesting crossroads, I think, as a nation and as a state. Um, and just making sure we have kids that uh, we are either, it, and it seems like the decision is, do we get the kids ready for maybe this end of course test, or are we getting kids ready for college or career? And uh, sometimes those don't jive together as well because of the accountability system that we have to have, because we have to keep costs at a certain level, things like that. And so if you, if you shoot for the college and career readiness piece and aim above the mark, then you're going to hit the mark. At, at the testing level or anything like that. So um, I think that's an advice that I actually have given to uh, you know, a first year teacher who is working at my school now. He was my student teacher last year. Just aim above. Um, we have standards, we have support documents, things like that, and that's great, but that's not the curriculum. Standards are not curriculum. Curriculum is, is the meat of how we get, standards may be the bones, but curriculum, how do we get to the point where we're getting kids ready to exceed, not, not just make a minimally adequate you know, stance or, or get to that point, but exceed it. So aim above the mark to hit the mark with your students, and it'll, it'll hit every time. Exactly. 
Mm -hmm. And my message would be to stay true to yourself. Mm -hmm. I think when new educators come into the field, I think it's very true those relationships are so important. And there's going to be a lot of initiatives and a lot of change and a lot of come and go and new things coming out as the years progress. But I think everyone that has a heart to be a teacher has some special gifts within themselves and you need to utilize those and you need to remain true to those. Um, you need to be authentic in who you are. Mm -hmm. The world is changing and to have our students ready for the world we have to change also what we're doing. And sometimes that's a harsh reality. <laughs> um, if you had any last words of advice for a teacher who's maybe struggling right now, what would you say to that teacher? Never forget that on your worst day you may be a child's last hope. Mm -hmm. So you don't know the impact that you're making mm -hmm. and if you'll take away just a positive from each day or each class, you know that you're making a difference and you may not know the potential of what that difference is until many years down the road. It's a one day at a time journey, uh, but don't measure it as every day as in, is, it has to get better, it has to, it has to become better. You um, have to look at progress over time and um, again building those relationships with the students is, is where it's at. Keep pressing on, keep planting seeds, impact will come over time. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> I think that it's important for them to understand that they are someone's champion and they were put in that position uh, for a reason. It's a calling, not a career. Um, and, you know, live it out um, and just and wait for that opportunity to when you can look back and say, <laughs> wow, if it weren't for my presence, where would that child be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I know we in South Carolina are very fortunate to have you five as our finalists. You are obviously teachers who care very much for your students, and you're very knowledgeable in your content areas, but also I think you're in the profession for the right reasons, and I think your colleagues are fortunate to have you as teacher leaders. So thank you so much for sharing that with us today. I really appreciate it. During each program, we like to showcase some of the wonderful things that are going on in our Carolina classrooms. Tonight, we're featuring Ms. Turner's Biology II class at Spartanburg High School. In Ms. Turner's class, instead of the standard written lab report, students use their math books and classroom hover cams to create dissection documentaries. This video was produced by senior student Asia Boyd and Spartanburg High's technology integration specialist, Adam Babcock. How we incorporate technology in our class? Well, in each of Ms. Turner's class, we did weird worm and squid dissection, which was awesome and fun. But it's like, we did it a little differently. Ms. Turner wanted us to do a documentary. So, with the use of our MacBook and the um, hover cam, it was very fun and interesting. And like, a lot of students were really engaged and concentrated in our work. I feel that if we wasn't using, like, if we didn't have technology in our classroom, we would have been using like pen and paper and that would have been really boring but it was still kind of nasty. This right here is the head of the worm. Here, those are the gills. Using the hover cam was very easy. All we had to do was just take the hover cam, plug it into our MacBook, then we go to our QuickTime and then use the setting, then boom, hover cam to the MacBook. And we saw squid and worm organs. Miss Turner is our biology two teacher. And as you can see, she is very involved in her students' work and very helpful. But as you can see that once we catch on, it's like we are very productive and just concentrate and it was very interesting so it was so cool so it's like if it wasn't for her we would probably have been lost confused not knowing what to do so thank you miss turner So I think what made it really interesting that we actually get to use technology and kind of record ourselves. So it was pretty fun and interesting. Oh yeah, that's how we use technology in the classroom and it's very fun. Bye.
we would like to invite you to submit a short video, two minutes or less, showcasing your students for possible use on a future Carolina Classrooms episode. Please visit our website at scetv.org forward slash learn or the Pinterest site that you see on the screen to find out the rules and find out how to submit your video. So we're going to continue talking just a little bit about some of the things that we saw in that video. Um, obviously, they're using a lot of technology in the classroom. What are some really innovative things some of your students have done on projects or in your classrooms that maybe you've spearheaded or maybe they've come up with on their own? Something that we did this year uh, at our school was we, we, we're an expeditionary learning school at Meadow Glen Middle School um, in Lexington. And one of our case studies this year was to ask students what it meant to make the choice to serve. And so we got with them and met with uh, some different community experts, some from ETV and some from local government, and found that there are 26,000 veterans in Lexington County. And one of the uh, things that we decided to do with that was, well, let's invite a couple veterans into our school and have students interview them uh, using the iPads. We have one-to-one -one technology, and um, we used iPads, and we had cameras that we borrowed from different schools, and uh, we brought in some veterans. And then it kind of transformed itself. One day we had about 11 veterans that had signed up, and then we ended up having about 30, and by the end of it all, we ended up having 71 veterans that came in wow. and uh, worked with our students. And they told their story, some of which had never, some of whom had never told their story before. We had a, a couple folks who said they just had a box of items from Vietnam that they just shoved in the back of the closet and hadn't pulled them out in 35 years. So it was really interesting for the students, really interesting for, for them, I think, to be able to come out and tell the stories. And uh, technology being the, the gateway to everything else in the world, um, it, it, without it, 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 wouldn't, it just wouldn't have been as effective. Now, right now, the kids are editing uh, those, those pieces of footage and putting them in making documentaries about about each of those veterans and we'll present that information in the form of an ebook toward the end. So there's lots of different programs and different pieces that mm -hmm. uh, have gone into this puzzle and it has been a struggle, it has been a challenge, but I think in the end it's going to be a really cool thing. Well, and what a wonderful way to archive local history. Definitely, as well. and there's so many more veterans and what, what I think we hope to do is maybe put the program together um, so that we can send it to other schools that might be interested in doing and replicating it. Wonderful. What other what other things are happening? I think it's it's a very unique time because uh, it allows students to buy in. Oftentimes they know vastly more than we do mm -hmm. um, when it comes to technology, so it, it gives them freedom. Um, and we we have so much going on. We have kids that are making their own apps. Mm -hmm. We have students that are uh, told their teachers, you know, versus doing a um, review sheet let's do a mini movie. Um, so then it becomes this hour and a half video before the end of the year of you know all the things that they learned through that year. Or we have students that are um, creating uh, ways to encapsulate their time within our high school um, so that they're, they're able to like, look back on their, their positive memories uh, at school. So if anything, it's, it's definitely been a, an interesting way for students to connect and have buy-in to, to our schools and, and what's going on, and then they become our teachers. Mm -hmm. And using the technology to advance just a number of the 21st century skills that we're trying to develop in our students. <coughs> I know the one-on-one -on -one technology with the iPad has just opened up just a world of allowing students to have choices in the products that they create, the apps that they may use, or technology venues that they may use, but creating videos and working a lot interdisciplinary um, ways to make it richer for students. I know one thing that we did was collaborate with the dance instructor and students created dances of learning about the seasons and how the earth rotates as it revolves, um, as it travels around the sun and just that interconnection and that interdisciplinary mm -hmm. focus and then they developed movies from their dances and just a lot of that just really makes it realistic and relevant for the students. One of the things that my class did one time was I asked them to choose one <clears throat> real life situation for to represent each of the units we had studied and they created a music video. And so 
it took them almost an entire semester um, that they were able to apply each of the lessons that we had done to something going on in their own lives. And it was a really interesting accomplishment. I, I like that year-end re- uh, movie idea. I don't think I'm going to borrow that in the <laughs> classroom. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty neat idea. So. I know. We, I think that we, we're in a, a time where we can learn a lot from our students. Um, and I think that they are out exploring things that maybe we haven't even had time to, to mm-hmm. get out there and explore mm-hmm. ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that you all mentioned in doing this was that collaboration piece and working with other teachers. Um, what are some ways that you intentionally um, maybe even create opportunities to collaborate or to plan together? I think that as you were saying in the in the other segment earlier, how essential that is, mm-hmm. that don't do it alone piece. Um, how, how can teachers who do feel isolated or who are seeking that collaboration with other teachers or even in their own content areas or other content areas, how do you plan for that? Don, I, I would say, again, it, it's, it's very intentional. Um, that 12, 15 year veteran, even eight year veteran, um, you know you're doing something well in your classroom and we all admit it's humbling sometimes when the spotlight's on us but we know we're doing well um we have to build those relationships with other teachers because we just get better when we're stronger together and um it, it so it needs to be intentional and um and, and i've purposefully you know i deal with professional development and within my district i purposely work with the the pre-service teachers i purposely work with you know the mentoring teachers you know that mentor them with their first or second or third years i i deliberately work with our national board teachers uh, those are aspiring to be national board educators in our district um i'm not saying this to draw focus to myself um it's it has to be intentional because every time you get around these educators well i get better first off um but then we start to develop a network and we have to have that that network of, of collegial support and um so I, again i would i would encourage those veteran teachers out there that that are kind of clicking along that are doing well to reach out and, and and find those those other educators and come alongside them and help i think we have to open our doors i know that's one mm-hmm. thing i always say you know <clears throat> if a teacher's struggling come in and see my class mm-hmm. you're not going to see a perfect classroom you know you mm-hmm. might see the same problem that you're having in your room but come see how i deal with it and then i'll go visit their classrooms too so that i can give them a perspective of what i saw because sometimes you don't really know what's going on in the parts of the room you can't see as well when you're trying to teach 30 children and so i think mm-hmm. it's important that we just open our doors mm-hmm. and share our knowledge and work together when it's a unique working atmosphere where we're all working towards the same goal. Um, so it's not a competition, <coughs> technically, um, <laughs> between one another. But uh, so I, I always tell teachers, you know, just, just go ask. Like, I mean, you know, you're working with probably the, the largest group of humanitarians that there are, you know, they'll give That's you anything. Yeah. Um, I remember my very first year walking in and asking for some assistance with the course I was teaching and being given literally boxes of, of items and, and things. And, and here's some, you know, here's some items that you might want to use next week. And here's the entire curriculum plan for the entire year if you want that. Um, so it, sh- it just revolves around that, you know, that having a relationship with an individual to say, hey, I need help. Um, we're not going to judge you. It's okay. Um, we were all there at one point. So it wasn't for the, our strong mentor teachers that we had um, by choice or not by choice. If um, some of us latched on to them, then we wouldn't certainly be here today. And it's not, sorry, Albert. It, it's not always a struggle, too. I mean, it, it, uh-huh. I like that, that fresh blood that's coming out mm-hmm. into the classroom. They, they, you know, they, they sharpen my saw type of thing, and so it's, it's, a, it's a good way Bringing to... Bring perspectives. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think something else that we can do uh, as a 21st century group is take to the web, take mm-hmm. to cyberspace, get mm-hmm. on Twitter, get on Facebook, get on Instagram. Um, we all in South Carolina, speaking from a social studies standpoint, every seventh grade social studies classroom covers essentially the same material. Why are awesome things happening in Charleston that I don't know about? Or awesome things happening in Spartanburg that I can't use in my class? Mm -hmm. So part of that is like breaking down the barriers between not only our classrooms and keeping the doors open, but between districts. There are awesome things happening. And I I go places and see it um, and, and, and 
am able to see it in some cases. We had a showcase of learning last week at E.L. Wright uh, Middle School um, over in Dan's territory, and uh, or actually at Richland too, but nearer to your territory. Um, and it was it was a fantastic, awesome day to see other teachers in action. But after that, they had left uh, a hashtag that we could still go back and post things. So getting to that point where where we're able to post our ideas and not feel, I don't want to say ashamed, but not feel like they're not good enough to post. Mm -hmm. Pinterest has opened up a whole world right. for teachers. Teachers mm -hmm. love Pinterest, things like that. You're getting great ideas and being able to contribute to other people's great ideas. There's so many awesome things happening. And again, the standards are the same from Charleston all the way to Greenville, exactly. all the way to mm -hmm. uh, you know North Augusta, all over the place. So how can we get to the point where we feel comfortable enough sharing uh, intra-district Right. wide throughout the state. Or even nationally. Or, or mm -hmm. right. dare say it, even nationally. Um, you know, we are trying to foster that that feeling of feeling safe to take risks for our students, and we need to be willing to take those risks and model that for our students as well, I think, is part of what you're saying, I think. Um, if you have a teacher, a maybe could be veteran teacher or a brand new teacher who sees you and who thinks that's I want to be like that? I want to, I want to be a leader. What advice would you give a teacher who's who's feeling like maybe they're on the brink of being able to take some steps towards leadership? I'd say you can't be somebody else. Mm -hmm. You need to find your own niche. You mm -hmm. need to find what it is that you feel passionate about, and then share that with everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get on the path to leadership. Mm -hmm. You have to just open your door and be open about what you love, mm -hmm. and when you do that, people will come to you. Mm -hmm. Be approachable mm -hmm. and be real. Be honest and real. Um, not everything's easy. Not everything is wrapped in a pretty bow, um, but being able to have real relationships and share. At our school, we've had a real focus this past year on establishing professional learning communities. And our administration has set aside specific times for us to be able to meet with other teachers that have common ground. For example, I might meet with the other eighth grade teachers that teach science. And just time to share, time to look, what's going well, what could we improve on, working to develop common assessments. And the more you're just willing to share and open up and staying authentic and true to yourself, mm -hmm. then you find yourself in a position where other people come and, and question of you and ask of you. I think it's such a um, a platform that a lot of people see. You know, it takes X, Y, Z, and then I'm going to suddenly become a leader. Uh, and so, I always talk to uh, to my fellow peers, and, and when I, you know, give them opportunities to be able to showcase their their knowledge. Um, Offer them that opportunity to present at that next PD instead of yourself. Um, talk to them about being members of professional organizations that allow them areas of growth. Um, I, I, when I talk to my friends about the idea of being a leader, um, the thought comes to mind, never take yourself seriously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you're authentic, if you're true, if it comes from the heart, you're going to be a leader. Um, it, but it's, it's not a, it's not a, a step to method. Mm -mm. Well, I have really enjoyed our conversations today, and I really thank you for the advice that you've shared with our our budding teachers and our veteran teachers and our students out there. Um, we are going to find out soon, at the end of the show actually, um, <laughs> which one of you will represent us as the State Teacher of the Year, but I think that um, each and every one of you are very well deserving of that. So congratulations to all Thank of you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. As we said at the beginning of tonight's program, in order to get all of our finalists together, we taped this program before the winner was announced. We'll leave you now with video of that announcement at the 50th South Carolina Teacher of the Year celebration. Be sure to join us on May 27th at 7 p.m. for another Carolina Classrooms. I'm Dawn Samples. Good night. Superintendent Spearman, would you do the honors? I've always wanted to say this. May I have the envelope, please? Here we go. <laughs> For our social media friends, I'm trying to live tweet your big announcement. Okay. So this is huge. Okay. 
And may we have a little drum roll, please. I hope the font's big enough that I'll have to. The 2000, let's make sure I get this right, okay? Here we go. <laughs> The 2016 South Carolina Teacher of the Year, Suzanne Cody, Sumter High School. <laughs> Mark this down in your calendars. April 22nd, Suzanne Cody is speechless. <laughs> it may never happen again. Um, there's so many people I need to thank. My family, who have been tremendously supportive of me, especially through the amazing journey I've had this past year. My district family, who has been there for me, and many of them are here tonight. And I am just one representative of the amazing teachers that we have in Sumter, so I'm so proud to stand here for them. And all of the sponsors and everyone who made tonight possible, our wonderful superintendent, and of course BMW, <laughs> and all everyone um, here tonight, thank you. I celebrate this with all the finalists and with all the teachers of the year. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2016 South Carolina Teacher of the Year, Suzanne Cody. <laughs> 